a little on numerical algorithms. <clears throat> and I say a little because you know, course on numerical algorithms would be sort of its own course. And I just want to talk about a few things. So <clears throat> one classic example, something that I think you should at least hear about, is something known as the FFT. And this is called the Fast Fourier Transform. And <clears throat> so this is uh, originally, it's attributed to Cooley and Tukey in the 50s. Although it was later discovered, I mean, many people sort of had discovered this. Gauss sort of knew this, you know, maybe in the 18, maybe 1890s, or maybe even earlier. I, I don't, Gauss maybe 1850s, in the 1800s. So what often happens is that people discover something and then go back and realize that Gauss knew about it all along and wrote some notes about it, which he left on the side. And that's sort of what happened with this. Uh, remarkably, Gauss even seemed to have some idea of time complexity. Like in some of his works, it seemed like he was thinking about questions in terms of that. OK, so to, maybe the best way to motivate the FFT is to consider the problem of polynomial multiplication. Just fairly simple question of, I give you a polynomial that I'll call, let's say, f of x is equal to the summation of, I'll use uh, ai x to the i, i going from 0 to n. Maybe let's make it n minus 1 so that the size of the input is n. And g of x is equal to bi x of i, i going from 0 to n minus 1. So just you want to multiply these two polynomials, right? <clears throat> so f g, so what is f g? Well, okay, so you would do the usual cross multiplication. So your degree goes to 2n minus, probably 2n minus 2, if I'm not mistaken, right? Goes from 0 up to 2n minus 2. And so what you would have here is x to the i. And so the question is, what is the coefficient of x to the i? And so what happens is you choose one term from f, one term from g, so that the product gives you an x to the i. Right. So what you could do is if you chose the jth term here, you would choose the i minus jth term over there. And if you sum this over all values of j, j less than i, then you would essentially get the coefficient. Right? So let's write down this coefficient. We'll say we do the sum over all j less than or equal to i. So we'll take a j and b i minus j. <coughs> Yeah, does that make sense? A j b my i minus j. So if you think about this, this is very similar to integer multiplication, because if instead of x you put two to the i, and you think of a i's and b i's as bits, then this is just the value. Of, of, of that bit string. Summation of ai2 to the i is like just the binary representation. And so this multiplication is also, it subsumes integer multiplication. Does that make sense? Like if you wanted to multiply two integers, you could also represent it as, I mean, you could generalize, you could say, well, I'm going to treat each integer where the ai's are the bits, and I'll just set x to be 2. 
and similarly with that. <coughs> okay, so now the reason why I point that picture out is let's just say this is, uh, I'll call this capital A and capital B, which is just A's and the B's. Right? Maybe I should have called this capital A instead. Sorry. So, and you've, you know, you know that addition is just about looking column by column. But when you need to multiply, you have to look at various terms. So if you want to multiply to get, let's say, the ith term, let's say you want the ith term here, what happens is you kind of look at, let's just say this is going from 0 to n minus 1. You multiply this term with this term, then this term with this term, so on and so forth. And then you sum all of those to get one term here. Does that make sense? <clears throat> right? So you have to sum all. So it's like you fix i, and then you take things over the sum. OK? So this has a name, and this is also called the convolution. It's the convolution of a and b is essentially this. Meaning that if I represent this as now a vect as a as an array or a vector, I call this thing C, then I can say you know C is something like A star B. It's the convolution. And so you want to compute the convolution. If you've ever heard of Fourier transforms, Fourier transforms also are all about computing convolutions. So, but we can, you know, instead of Going into that, we can just think of this numerical problem of how do you multiply two polynomials. So, <clears throat> okay, so what is the naive algorithm, the direct algorithm to do this? How long will it take? N squared. N squared. Why N squared? You, multiply you multiply all pairs with each other and you get everything, right? So, the trivial. Algorithm is O of n square. You can actually try to do something like Karatsuba, and it would work. Right? You could do some divide and conquer exactly the way we did it for integers, you, you, and it would work. But let me tell you about a different algorithm by Cooley and Tukey, which is really about, they were thinking about computing Fourier transforms. So the way to motivate it over here is, well, OK, instead, so here's a different way of computing the product of two parts. OK, so let me so step back. F and G are polynomials of degree basically n minus 1, right? Suppose you want to compute a polynomial given its values. Suppose I evaluate the polynomial at a bunch of places. How many evaluations do you need to be able to reconstruct the polynomial? I give you a polynomial. I tell you that here's a polynomial of degree n, say n, or n minus 1. How many evaluations of that polynomial do you need to reconstruct it exactly? Suppose there's a line. A linear polynomial line. How many evaluations of the polynomial, of the linear polynomial, do you need to know what the line is? Two, right? So if you have two points, two evaluations, right? So if I have this, and here's some unknown linear polynomial, I say, well, here's an evaluation, here's an evaluation, then you know exactly what the line is. If it's, suppose it's a quadratic, then how many do you need? Yeah? Three. three. Why three? <coughs> yeah? OK, good. Clearly, he remembers his linear equation. He remembers his high school math. Good. You've learned a lot in high school, except you've forgotten it all. But there's a lot that you learned that was useful. 
Exactly, right? So the point is, if you take a quadratic, a quadratic looks like ax squared plus bx plus c. Or in my notation, it would be a2x squared plus a1x plus a0. There are three unknowns you need to figure out. So for three unknowns, you need three equations. And so you plug in three different values of x, and you get three equations. And then that determines the polynomial. Hence, for f, how many do you need? n evaluations. So if I gave you n evaluations, n distinct evaluations, n distinct evaluations, you should be able to figure out what f is. OK, so given n distinct evaluations. By distinct, I mean you can't just evaluate the same. You know, I just can't give you the same point over and over again. right? I have to give you different evaluations. Given n distinct evaluations, f or g are determined. Right? So if I give you n evaluations, you're done. So why is this going to be useful? Well, suppose I did the following. Suppose I did the following. <clears throat> Instead of trying to compute the coefficients of fg, I try to compute the evaluations of fg, of the product. How many evaluations of fg do you need to be able to reconstruct fg? Two and my y. Sorry? Because they are two and minus one unknown uh, coefficients. Because its degree is two and minus two, so you need the degree plus one. So for any polynomial, for any polynomial in one variable. We need d plus 1 evaluations, any degree d. d plus 1 evaluations to reconstruct the polynomial. Okay, so here is going to be my approach. Pick 2n minus 1 uh, choices, which, you know, I will just to give it a different name, I don't want to give it x and y. I'm going to give it, I'll call it, um, I'll give it a Greek symbol. I'll just refer to it as, as gamma. Okay, so I'll, I'll call it gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, up to gamma of 2n minus 2. So these are certain values in let's say let's say real numbers okay but technically i'm i'm actually going to choose complex numbers but we'll get there eventually i'm just going to choose i could choose a bunch of integers just choose 0 1 2 3 4 right i could choose those choices so what i could do is compute f of gamma 0 f of gamma 1 and f of gamma 2n minus 2. And then I compute g of gamma 0, g of gamma 1, g of gamma 2n minus 2. Now what I could do is I could just multiply these. Each of those I could just multiply. And if I multiply all of them, what I would get what is f of gamma 0 times g of gamma 0? Well, that's fg of gamma 0. It's the product evaluated at gamma 0. So I'll get fg gamma 0, fg gamma 1, fg gamma 2n minus 2. And this, now I could try to reconstruct fg.
right? This makes sense? So instead of trying to multiply the polynomial, I multiply the evaluations of the polynomial. And then if I have enough evaluations, I can try to reconstruct. Okay, so let's just suppose we do this naively, and suppose for gamma 0 to gamma 2 and minus 2, I just choose integers 0, 1, 2, 3. I could do that, right? I could just choose n integers. Let, let, let's see what the running time is going to be. So how long does it take to compute a single evaluation of a polynomial? Here's your polynomial. Where, where is it? Right? If I want to compute one evaluation, how long is it going to take me? Assume that you can multiply integers and you can do, let's say you can do arithmetic in constant time, like just like the way you do it on your computer. If you want to add two things, you just add. Let's say that's constant time. So we're not dealing with the bit complexity of each individual addition or multiplication. We're assuming that you can do it in constant time. How many additions or multiplications do you need to compute f of gamma 0? Maybe 0 is easy, f of gamma 1. A single evaluation, how long? n time, right? Well, you just, you have to compute the power. Let's just say you're able to do that efficiently. One has to deal with that, but I said that you can, let's just say you can do the arithmetic operations in constant time. Okay, so, so you just need n operations. Each evaluation takes n operations. You need at least 2n minus 2 operations. And each, op, each of these evaluations is going to cost you n. So this seems like it's n squared right there. Just to compute n evaluations is n squared. Your multiplying is OK. So you just have to do n multiplications, like O of n multiplications. That's, this is important. You just do O of n multiplications. Then you have to do the reconstruction. How do you do the reconstruction? Well, exactly as was said, like you basically solve a system of linear equations. But all of that seems like it's looking like you, this evaluation itself is n squared. So the whole thing seems hopeless. And so the cleverness of FFTs says that if you carefully choose these, you can actually evaluate this in n log n. But you have to choose, you have to get the right choice of gamma. That you can actually compute, it's like somehow if all your evalu, so what you're doing, the problem is n squared is that you're doing these O of n evaluations independently. You're doing one, then you're doing the next, doing the next. You're not using the information that you got from the previous one and the next one. So if you could somehow choose, so for example, just as a simple example, to compute f of 0 is constant time. Because you just take a 0. And f of 1 is the sum of everything. OK, you could compute that once. Maybe if you know the sum, you could try to compute something else more efficiently. Right? That's kind of the idea. Okay? So <coughs> the choice that is used, the choice that is used is, okay, you use complex numbers here. So that's sort of the magic here. So what we'll do is we'll actually set so we'll say gamma is, um, I think what we will need here, let me see if I, yeah, so, so gamma is going to be an nth root of unity. Complex numbers, if you remember your complex numbers, Right, this is the argand plane, right? Where you have um, this is the real, this is your imaginary, 
right? And then if you if you think of the roots of unity lie on this on the circle, right? Going back to maybe some high school, maybe some uh, some of your first few courses in your undergrad, you may have seen some of this stuff, and then you know you have this root of unity. Does this, this seem vaguely familiar? Right? So essentially you could, basically it's e to the 2 pi divided by n, right? Uh, i, sorry. Where i is, of course, the square root of minus 1. Yes, no, it seems vaguely familiar. Maybe way back in the past you've seen this at some point. Hmm? So you choose one of the roots of unity, the nth root of unity, actually. And it turns out that all of these calculations of computing the various evaluations is going to be really easy. Okay, so it's sort of somewhat remarkable if you think about it. Okay, any questions? Right. It is going to be convenient for us. So technically, okay, so I'm kind of, I'm going to say it's capital N. Okay, and capital N is actually going to be something like 2N minus 1. So what I'm going to imagine, imagine that F, G, and fg are degree n polynomials with zero coefficients. All right, this is simply saying that instead of thinking of f and g of having degree little n, I could think of it having degree capital N just by making all the other coefficients zero. Okay. It's just going to be easier for me to think about that. Because I'm actually going to do capital N evaluations, and I'm going to do things with square matrices and whatnot. OK, all right. So, so what we want to do is to compute, we want to compute f of gamma to the power 0, f of gamma to the power 1, f of gamma to the power 2, up to f of gamma to the power n minus 1. These are our I'm sorry, not gamma, omega. I'm sorry, omega. And so omega i, gamma i, is omega to the power i. So in terms of this plane, in the, the argon plane, you're doing evaluations on all of these different points. Now this is one of the, the magic, magical things in, in math, which is sometimes Moving to complex numbers makes things easier. And this appears in many different strange places where when you move to complex numbers, suddenly things start happening. Um, so we will compute all these n values. So we'll compute this. We will compute that. Then we can do the multiplication, and we'll get And then from here, we can do the reconstruction, or the inversion. And turns out this can also be done efficiently. OK? So this is how the FF, well, the FFT is just actually just, the FFT is just computing this. This process here, this is called the inverse FFT. Or the in, so this is called the FFT, or sometimes you'll see it being referred to as the DFT, is the discrete Fourier transform, meaning these values here 
are called the DFT. The FFT is the algorithm to compute it. And then here you have to do what's called an inverse discrete Fourier transform. But the same algorithm is going to work. OK? That's the idea. And it turns out this can be essentially done in O of n log n. And this can be done in O of n log n. And the way we get n log n is we are going to see our favorite recurrence, the merge sort recurrence. This is likely one of the earliest places where divide and conquer was actually used, without it actually even being set as divide and conquer. I think, if I'm not mistaken, this probably predates merge sort. Questions? Make sense? Of course, I haven't told you how this is done. And that's going to be the magic. But that is, so the fast Fourier, so if you remember nothing else, if you just remember this, the fast Fourier transform is an algorithm to compute these values. That's what it is. Okay, so that's what you need to remember. It's, unlike, it's likely that you'll forget the algorithm that I'll talk about, which is unfortunate because it's beautiful, but it's likely that you'll forget. But at least remember that that's what the fast Fourier transform does. So if you ever see it in the future, you say, what is this fast Fourier transform? It's basically computing these values. These values meaning that you are given a polynomial and you're evaluating the polynomial on those numbers. Okay, now, given that we're talking about polynomials, it's really important to now think about it also in terms of matrices. And when you think about it in terms of matrices, a lot of this becomes a lot clearer. Any questions about at this point? Right, so we have to solve. This reconstruction is also going to be, so it's all going to be linear systems, which I'll show you. OK, so now let's go further. So let's try to understand what this is. So here's a, a different way of understanding polynomial evaluation. So remember, our polynomial f was written as the summation of ai, x to the i, i going from 0 to n minus 1. Right? Suppose I write down all the coefficients here. Mm -hmm. What is a row? So a row, I can look at this as a dot product of two vectors. I can think of it as a dot product of two vectors, right? Where one vector is the coefficient vector, the second vector is like the power vector. And the dot product of these is an evaluation. This observation is going to be key to how we will re I mean, it's, it's sort of obvious in hindsight, but really to observe that evaluation. Now, the, the good thing about this viewpoint is this vector here is independent of x. Right? This vector is independent of x. So what I can do is I can construct a matrix that only depends on the values. And this vector only depends on the coefficients. They're independent of each other. So what's nice is the matrix that I write essentially just has all of the point powers in, a, in rows. So every row is one of these point powers. I, I hope this makes sense. Right? And, and if you look at what is this equal to, so the, the evaluations are basically this. 
And what I do over here, so omega to the 0 is 1. 1, omega, omega squared, to omega. So then I do evaluation on omega. Uh, I should probably put, um, this is also 1, sorry. Does this make sense what I'm doing here? Each row is like, OK, so it's basically this, where I put omega as x, then I get the, so when I put omega to the power 0, I get the top row. When I put omega to the power 1, I get the next row. When I put omega to the power 2, I get this row, so on and so forth. This indexing is going to make it a little painful for us. I'm going to just re-index things a bit. But this is the idea. This is the matrix that we're looking at. So let me write this out over here. Um, I, I'm going to do a bit of shifting things around. I hope it doesn't bother you. I could just move things around a bit. So I'm going to put omega, omega square, omega cube, do omega to the n minus 1. Then I'll put omega square, omega to the fourth, omega to the sixth, omega to the 2n minus, um, sorry. I'll put omega to the n over here. So omega to the n is the same thing as 1. Omega to the 0 and omega to the n are the same thing because it's an nth root of unity. So it's going to be convenient to do it this way instead. Omega cube, omega to the, what is it, 6, omega 9, all the way to the omega to the n, omega to the 2n. Although all of this is just 1, and all of these are just 1. And I'm actually multiplying this by, you know, because I've moved the columns around a bit, technically A0 goes here, and this is A1, A2, up to An minus 1. This is going to be unimportant. So now at some point, like, we can move the columns and rows around as long as we're consistent. Right? So it's all about just multiplying this matrix with this vector. Now, if you think about it naively, how many entries are in this matrix? n squared, capital N squared. So if you were to simply write this matrix out, you're going to spend n squared, in which case you could have just multiplied the polynomials in the first place. So the point is, we are going to compute this product without actually writing out this matrix. We're going to very cleverly rearrange the matrix in such a way that we never write the matrix explicitly. But we use symmetries of the roots of unity to be able to do it. So just, what is the, if you look at this matrix, the ij entry is omega ij. Right, because the ith row is evaluating on omega to the power i. The jth column is like looking at the jth power of that, because it's that power, um, because it's that power vector. This thing has a name. It's called a Vandermond matrix. And Vandermond matrices are very well behaved. OK, that's, that's kind of the point. So this matrix M. So what we have is, I can refer to this as the vector A. What we want to compute is M times A. So the input is size N, the output is size N, but the intermediate computations look like they're N squared. And so the cleverness is on how do you do the intermediate computations more efficiently. This thing that I said, where the input and output are small, but the intermediate is large, is something that happens a lot, especially in data science. Where you might think of your input as something, 
Your output is just some sort of something that you want to, maybe you want to cluster the points or something. But the intermediate computations, if you do it, brute force will often be very expensive. Because you have to compute some matrix, you have to multiply with the matrix. The computation of the matrix itself is going to be expensive. And so what you often want to do is to see if you can multiply without computing the matrix itself. You might say, how is that even possible? And what we'll see here is that essentially there are certain symmetries that you can exploit here. Is, is everyone following what's, what's going on? Again, this is the DFT of A. The FFT is an algorithm to compute it. So far, so good? So the observation is essentially, OK, kind of like, let's, let's do it this way. Um, if you look at the, the odd columns, or maybe let me do it. Look at the even columns. which means that essentially you're setting uh, j to be even. Then it's actually not just a power of omega, it's a power of omega squared. The even columns look like powers of omega squared. And omega squared is an n over 2th root, root of unity. So it starts looking like a DFT of dimension n over 2. So let's go back here. This is the DFT of dimension n, where you're using an nth root of unity. But if you square the nth root of unity, so square means that you move to the next one, that thing is actually an n over 2th root of unity. Right? If omega n is equal to 1, then omega squared to the power n over 2 is equal to 1. So omega squared is an n over 2th root of unity. And the n over 2th root of unity is what you use for the n over 2 dimensional DFT. And so if you, you, know, you kind of stare at this a bit, you can pull out an n over 2th dimensional DFT here. And so what you do is then you use divide and conquer. You compute that. You do you use recursion. You compute that, and so on and so forth. Okay. So let's. I don't know. I mean, um, what's what's the time? I guess maybe this like the entire lecture is going to be fast for you. Trying. Who knows? I I don't I don't come here with a plan, which may, which maybe it shows. So I don't know. Should I just continue with this? Yeah. Should I continue with the? Okay. All right. So we'll just do. Fourier transforms today, then, and so be it. Okay. Um, I might make some mistakes because I haven't checked my indexing carefully because I wasn't planning on doing this. We'll see. We'll see where we go. Okay. So let's kind of write this out as I'll write xi. So, right? So I'll just say x1 up to xn. That's equal, right? So let's write what xi is. So xi is omega to the power i, omega to the power 2i, omega to the 3i, omega to the uh, ni. So I'll say this dot a1, a2. I'm just going to call this guy a capital N. Okay. Just call this thing A capital N. OK, so uh, this is equal to a summation of, um, so we, yeah, OK, J going from 1 to N of A, J, omega to the I, J. All right? So I'm just going to split this into the 
odd and even terms. Okay, so let's write this. Um, let's write the even part first. So the even part would be going from j from two to n, or maybe let me sorry let me let me let me be more precise here. I'll just say I'm going from k is going from one to n over two of a two k omega to the i times 2k plus k going from 1. Assume that capital N is like a power of 2, just to make life easy. a to the uh, 2k minus 1 omega to the i 2k minus 1. Yeah, so far so good. OK? So the first quantity is k is equal to 1 to n over 2, a to the 2k omega square, uh, omega square to the i k. OK? So if you look at this, right, and you think about if you vary i and you vary k, this thing kind of looks like the DFT of the even part of A. So I'll, I'll make this clear. And in the second part, what I get is, so the omega to the minus i is a constant with respect to the sum. So I can just pull this thing out. Omega to the right? So I just pull the omega to the minus i out. Okay. Now you see that this thing, you know, it's like if you kind of just look at this, look at that matrix over there, that matrix is omega ij. If you kind of, so you're varying k over here, but suppose you were to vary i as well, it's, it looks like the matrix for omega square. Except it's not a square matrix anymore because k goes from 1 to n over 2, i goes from 1 up to n. So it's not symmetric yet. Sort of kind of makes sense? It's really unfortunate because some of my students said they wanted to come when I teach the fast Fourier transform. I said, I don't think I'm going to do it this quarter. Um, and so anyway, now here I am doing the FFT. Yeah? I mean, I haven't done anything yet, but I've just sort of moved things or manipulated. The point to observe is if you just look at what this is, just stare at it just without paying too much attention to the coefficients, but pay a little bit of attention. So what you have is you have n over 2 numbers. That's A. Those are the n over 2 odd parts, right? So initially, you have, yeah, oh, here it is. So you have this. I've broken this up into the odd parts and the even parts. So n over 2, n over 2. It's like I'm computing some kind of Fourier discrete Fourier transform of the odd part here. I'm doing it for the even part here. Maybe, so far so good. OK. Except it's, it's not really like the DFT, because in this matrix, i has to go from 1 to n, j has to go from 1 to n. But here, i is going from 1 to n over 2, 
I'm sorry, k is going from 1 to n over 2, i is going from 1 to n. But if I just went up to n over 2, then this thing looks like actually the Fourier transform. The disc so suppose I look at x1 up to x n over 2. Just look at this part here. Mm -hmm. So just look at this part here. So then I look at all of these numbers. So what do I have in the ith part? I have the summation of k going from 1 to n over 2, a of 2k omega square to the ik, plus what do I have here? Well, OK, so I have some kind of a dot product here. So I get omega to the minus 1, omega to the minus 2, omega to the minus n over 2, dot product with. The dot product is because this, you, you'll see what, when I write, you'll see what I mean. I'm sorry, this is a bit of a mess, but like it's just this term, this summation here. Right? So it's like saying that if I vary i, I get n over 2 values here. And I get n over 2 values here. Except I have to scale each of these depending on i, so which I can write as a dot product here. But if I can recursively compute these, Oh, then I'm saved, right? I don't have to actually compute the matrix. I recursively compute this, recursively compute this. Just take a dot product with this, and linear time I have that. OK? Yeah? I'm just referring to the ith row of this whole thing. Sorry, like this is like, I'm just saying that this is the ith row, it's just a single, it's a column vector. And I'm looking for the ith row of that column vector. Now what is this? This is exactly the DFT of A1 to A, I'm sorry, A of the even part of your original vector. This is exactly, this is exactly, I mean, like if I could, I would write this out as I have i here and k here of omega square i k times a2, a4 up to a n. And this quantity here is exactly i k omega square i k, where now here it's a1 a3, so on and so forth, up to a n minus 1. Right, this is like, it's exactly that, right? Because each of these is a sum going of from varying over k, where I go omega 2 to the i k, right? It's exactly the same thing. Is this, do you see this? Right, so this, this is the DFT of half of it, and this is the DFT of the other half. So now, hopefully, you're seeing t of n is 2 times t of n over 2 plus o of n. Of course, I'm only computing half of these. I have to compute the other half as well. But you'll see that using these, I can also compute that other part. But do you see like t of n, which is the original computation, is 2 times t of n. So two recursive calls, each of size half plus o of n. It's beautiful. It's brilliant. I don't know how they saw this, but OK? So this is the DFT of A2, A4 up to AN. This is the DFT of that vector there. So this is, so I'm just going to write this out, sorry, separately so that we can see this x1 to xn over 2. So this is equal to 
I'll just say the DFT of A2, A4 to AN plus omega minus 1, omega minus 2, the minus n over 2, dot product with the DFT of A1, A3, up to An minus 1. OK, right? So, so far, so good. So we've computed half of the entries. But we now need to compute the other half as well. But you'll see that the other half is also going to be some combination of just these DFTs. OK, any questions about this? Is this clear? Right, so what we did, if you want to go back to this matrix view, is we kind of split the columns into even and odd. And we're looking at the top part of that. That gives you the first half of these entries. So we're kind of saying that if you just looked at every alternate thing over here, then that thing exactly looks like a fast Fourier transform matrix. Or the, I'm sorry, the DFT matrix. If you look at every odd part here, I'm sorry, every even part kind of obvious is, every odd part, it's a bit, it's scaled in some funny way because you have to take this dot product. Like the first part is kind of straightforward. The second part, you have to take this dot product, which is the shift. But that's again a linear time computation. Okay, but that's sort of what's going on with respect to the matrix is you split, you take the top half, and in that, you're looking at the even and odd rows. OK. So now what we're going to do is we have to compute the remaining n over 2 entries, where i goes from n over 2 plus 1 to capital N. And we'll see that we'll get expressions that look kind of like this, again with the shift. OK, so let's, let's kind of write that out. So let's look at the second half. So I'll just write it as i plus n over 2. And so what I get is, again, k goes from 1. So I'm just going to plug in. I'm just going to plug in this formula with i being like n over 2 plus i, because I'm looking at the second half of the entries. OK? So sorry for the abuse of notation, where I shift the i to n over 2 plus i, but it, it'll make the math a lot clearer. OK? So again, k goes from 1 to n over 2. A of 2k omega square i plus n over 2 times k plus omega to the minus i minus n over 2. So I'm just writing out that old expression from scratch here. Um, OK? Right? All I did was take whatever expression that we had from the original and just plug in, just saying that I'm looking at i plus n over 2. OK? So then let's manipulate the first one again. See, now we know what we're looking for. So we'll get a2k omega square i k times omega square to the n k over 2. Right? All I did was just break that up. But what is this? What is that? It's omega square to the power n over 2 to the power k. What is it? Can someone tell me what this is? What is this going to end up being? Write it out, and you will see. Just, just break up the exponents and open it up. Yeah? Omega to the nk. What is omega to the n? Yes? Huh? 
not 0. What is omega? What did we start with omega as? What is omega? The nth root of unity. What is omega to the power n? It's 1, right? That's what omega, we chose omega so that omega to the power n is 1. Which means magically this thing is just 1. Because omega square is an n over 2th root of unity. So this thing is just 1. And you magically get back the same thing that you, st that you, you wanted. You get the half DFT, and then we look at the next one. So this is omega square to the ik just as before times omega square to the nk over 2, which is again equal to 1. So it's the same expression, except now you have a different shift. But this is just a dot product. right? So what you get is that x. Uh, n over 2 plus 1 up to xn. This is equal to, again, the dft of a2 to an. Plus, now what you have here is omega to the minus n over 2 minus 1, omega to the minus n over 2 minus 2, omega to the minus n, times the dft of a1, a3, up to an minus 1. So what we do is if we compute these DFTs, these DFTs, we can use them for both of these things, right? So how many DFTs? You only compute two of them, because those, you shift and you, you, know, you do one linear combination, you get the first half. You do the second linear combination, you get the second half. But all of these are all just constant time, uh, sorry, linear time operations. So what you get is that t of n, which is the time to compute the full FFT, is at most 2 times t of n over 2 plus O of, I should say, capital N. Right? And so t of n is O of n log n. It's magic, right? You didn't even compute the matrix explicitly, but you have all the products. I mean, yeah, I don't know. You could say like, how? there's a famous quote by von Neumann that you don't, I mean, this is by von Neumann, who's probably one of the greatest mathematicians ever, who said that you never really understand mathematics. You just get used to it. And that's sort of what happens with this, right? You, this is because, you know, the spot that then when you take the second half, you essentially get that thing being one, it's complete, it's like black magic. Um, I mean, right, I mean, who needs religious miracles, right, when you have things like this? This is like, this is a miracle, essentially. So, again, this only, okay, so, uh, so far, I've only told you how to get this part. Now you have to do the, you might say, how do I do the reconstruction? So the reconstruct. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you the reconstruction shortly. Just yeah, yeah. But first, I want to make sure that you understand what happened here. So the DFT, the trick again, is when you look at this matrix here, which is the original matrix we started off with, right? You have this powers of omega in this matrix form times a. If you look at the top half and you break it up into the odd and the even, then you see the DFT of the odd part and the even part. And then when you look at the second half, you actually see the same DFTs. Except there's, there's different linear combinations. So you have to solve two DFTs of half the size, and then you add them up in different ways. 
Which is why you know, I, I go back and say divide and conquer algorithms always have some element of magic in them. And so this gives basically the merge sort recurrence. Okay? So maybe just to finish up, okay, so this gives you what we did through all of this was we got these evaluations. We have these evaluations, but now we need to compute the coefficients. OK, so suppose the coefficients are c1 to c capital N. So I'm just going to write. So what this means is that f of g is equal to, I'll just uh, use i going from 1 to capital N of ci x to the i plus cn. The constant term I'm denoting by capital N. Right? So suppose the co you have to solve for these coefficients now. Now here's what's remarkable. We know that this evaluation is the DFT of the coefficients. So in some sense, the DFT of c1 to cn is fg omega, fg omega square, fg omega to the n. So before, we wanted to compute the DFT. Now we want to invert the DFT. We know what the DFT is, and we want to know what C1 to Cn are. Another way of putting this is, here's your matrix omega to the ij times C1 to Cn. This is exactly equal to Fg omega Fg omega square, Fg omega n. Right, so, so we want to solve for C. So we have to invert this matrix. But you know the roots of unity are so well behaved that that inversion also is actually a discrete Fourier transform. So it turns out that if you look at this matrix, omega to the minus ij. This is the inverse. The inverse is exactly taking just minus ij, but omega to the minus 1 is also a root of unity, and the entire math works out as is. Because all I need is that omega is a root of unity. That omega to the power n is equal to 1, that's all I need. Omega to the power minus n is also equal to 1. Like omega to the minus 1 is also a root of unity, and all of that works. So you can essentially express C1 to Cn as this matrix. times fg omega, fg omega to the power n. And this is actually another, this is called the inverse, inverse DFT, the inverse DFT. But the same math works. The, the same algorithm and math. Right, as 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 the as the FFT. So then you can essentially invert the matrix as well, and the same computation works. And so you can do polynomial multiplication in n log n. Okay, so polynomial multiplication. N O of N log N. Small n, whichever. Okay, so okay, so that was the FFT. Uh, let's take a break for a few minutes, and then when we come back, I'll tell you some other algorithms, but clearly not in that much detail.
Sorry? That is a square matrix. Yeah, so you mean the matrix is always uh, square. Um, so essentially, you know, when you're computing the DFT, you're always dealing with square matrices because think of it as the way this is set up is if you're dealing with n entries, then you want to compute n evaluations. So you're always, matrix is always going to be square in this case. The bigger issue is if it's not a power of two, then sometimes you have odd even issues. You can always try to you know, blow up everything into a power of two, but often implementations will do something clever for those trick, for those things. Like suppose if n is odd as opposed to even, then you can, you know, you can start doing certain things. But does that make sense? I mean, in all of these settings, the, the DFT is defined to be with the square matrix. So which is so that's a good point because that's why that's why I actually imagined F and G to be degree capital N polynomials, even though their degree is actually smaller. I have to make their degree be larger because I want to do N evaluations. So kind of to get I have to get that square matrix out. Yeah. Sometimes like the the signal transmitter is like that's why the IS for your so scale for the electric So the signals don't have to be so think of in this case the signal is A. There is no demand on symmetry for A. But the point is if you want to get more that so let's say if you just do it directly, you'll get n minus one evaluations. So you say no, I want many more evaluations. So then you have to pad this with zeros. So another way to think of it is you can always take any vector and you pad it with zeros, and this gives you a longer vector. So you can make things square that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? OK, so again, like I don't expect you, I don't expect all of you at least to understand all the math behind what went into this in, you know, in one lecture. But at least I want you to sort of know, at least have some idea of what is the FFT, and to you know, get the, the power of divide and conquer. How you can use divide and conquer to compute things, when it, even though it seems like the intermediate computation is going to be large. So the next um, you know, a few things I wanted to tell you, just as numerical algorithms that at least you should have heard of, of course, there's the classic Gaussian elimination. So the point is, and especially these days with data science and machine learning, AX equal to B, meaning that you have a matrix, you have X. Right, this is an extremely important problem that comes up. How many of you have heard the term regression? You must have heard of, probably have heard of regression or linear regression. What is regression? Yeah? Once in a while, it has to do with like changes in the slope of you know, uh, an equation. Something, so t like, <clears throat> why do people continuously solve regression problems in practice? What are they trying to do? Exactly. So the idea is a very common, so think of any machine learning prediction sort of task. What you'll often have are features, and you're trying to predict a value. You have, you know, maybe you have people's Facebook posts, and you're trying to predict where they'll vote. You have people's credit history, and you're trying to predict uh, will they default or not. So you have features, and you're trying to predict something. So often, what you're trying to do is you're trying to predict 
you know, f of x, where x is your feature vector, and f of x is the outcome. You're trying to compute what f of x is. And what you have is training data. So what is training data? Well, training data is you have xi, f of xi pairs. So you have many of these that you've collected somehow. And so what you could do is you could try to train a linear model. Often they'll even call it a linear classifier. Sometimes classifiers are if f of x is 0, 1. Then you're classifying. Is this spam or is it not spam? So you train a linear. What is a linear model? So a linear model, one way you can think of it is f of x is just a dot product x. Or maybe it's the sine of a dot product x, which means what? It's like you put a plane in space. And saying everything on one side of the plane is a 0, and everything else on the other side is a 1. So this is called a linear model. To train a linear model means, given the data, you're trying to fit. You're trying to find an A. You're saying, what is the best A that is going to work? Another way to look at this is, if I just have two dimensions, I have a collection of points, and I'm trying to fit a line to these points. Now, there is no line that's going to fit perfectly. So you say, OK, let me try to find the best line. And this is known as a least squares fit. This is what regression, regression is trying to find the best fit. So regression is finding the best fit. Regression is like. You'd be surprised of how f few people know this. Even though everybody throws the term regression left, right, and center, many people don't even know what it means. It really just means, they think of it as some kind of really fancy thing about model fitting it. It's really much simpler than that. I give you a bunch of points in space, find a plane that sort of goes through as many points as possible. So find a line that fits as many points as possible. Now, it's not going to fit perfectly. So you say, OK, I do what's called a least squares fit, which means so the error of a model on the ith data point is what? So the true is this. Often this is referred to as yi. So let me instead call this yi. So you have xi, yi pairs. x is a vector, y is a scalar. Okay, so I'm just going to use yi. Is yi minus whatever model you chose squared. Okay? So it's like saying that I look at how far this is from that. And I, this is my error. I'm going to square the error. And so the total error is the sum over all points, all training data of yi minus a x squared. So find a. minimizing the error. This is called the least squares fit. This is the problem of regression. It's just that. I gave you a bunch of, and then you can do more fancier versions of this. Like if you see the general def definition of regression, instead of looking at xi, you could transform each feature separately. But it's, it basically ends up being the same thing. It's like saying that I could take each feature and scale it differently. But that's fine. You can do that. In the end, you're basically in some space, you're going to draw a bunch of points, and you're going to fit a plane. 
because the A defines a plane. Again, your sort of high school undergraduate geometry or whatever, like, right? Whenever you have a vector, you can use it to define a plane, right? That's the normal of that is a plane. So in this case, or you might say AI minus, um, yeah, minus some B or something. Like you can, you can, you can have some offset, right? So you could say your model is minus B, right? You take some plane and then you shift it. So to solve this, if you do a little bit of, it's not very complicated. I mean, actually, I was, I thought I'd do it, but I, I don't want to do it in the last five minutes. Is that this is equivalent? to solving a linear system of equations. Means that if I actually do some calculus, I can differentiate this expression with respect to my variables. So if I do the differentiation, I kind of write out what I get. I get a linear system. It's actually not very hard to write out the linear system. And you get a system of linear equations. And hence, solving systems of linear equations becomes really important. They're going back to our original problem of ax equal to b. And so Gaussian elimination is, again, one of those classic algorithms used to solve ax equal to b. And so systems of linear equations come when you do lots of training of models. Because somewhere in the whole machine, there's often a regression that is being done. These are often also called choosing weights. You want to try to understand? how much importance to give to each feature, where the A is like a weight. It's a linear weight. And so Gaussian elimination you know, solves linear systems. in essentially O of n cubed time. So another way of looking at this sometimes is If there actually exists a perfect fit, then the error is 0, which means you can write it out exactly as a system of linear equations. Like your a's are the unknowns. And for each data point, you want to get exactly f of xi. So you'll get a system of linear equations. When, you, when sometimes you get too many equations and too few variables, so you know that you, you are unlikely to satisfy all of them, then you do a least squares fit. You say, OK, fine, I'll try to satisfy as many of them as possible with this kind of a penalty for the ones that I don't. So this is called a least squares fit. Gaussian elimination is the algorithm. And Gaussian elimination is exactly what you learned way back when, is that you basically eliminate variable by variable. What you may hear sometimes is something called an LU decomposition. Has anyone heard this term before, LU decomposition? No? OK, so essentially, if you do Gaussian elimination, right? so if you, if you take a matrix, what happens? Right? You, you, you'll start from the first one, and then you eliminate all of these. right? So you transform it to something where all of these are 0. Right? And then you say, OK, let me look at the next one, and then I eliminate all of these, so on and so forth. What you end up with is a triangular matrix. Right? Upper triangular, at least the way I did it. So this is the U of the upper, LU. Now, again, if you go back to high school algebra as usual, when you take a row of a matrix, and you multiply it, you can also express that as multiplying the matrix with another matrix. Like there are ways of converting row operations into matrix multiplication. So actually, it turns out that if this matrix is M, an equivalent way of looking at this is really you can express M as a lower triangular matrix times an upper triangular matrix. If you really follow what Gaussian elimination is doing, it has actually is a way of factorizing a matrix into a lower part 
and an upper part. The upper part is actually the output that you get in the end. And the operations that you're doing can be expressed as a lower triangular matrix. Technically, you're permuting the matrix as you do it. Like sometimes what you do is you kind of, you have to pick a row where a particular entry is zero, a non-zero, to do the elimination. So you have to permute M. And that is expressed as multiplying by a permutation matrix. So this is a permutation matrix. A permutation matrix is one where in each column and row, there's only one, one, and everything else is zero. So Gaussian elimination is also called, is also sometimes written as this equation, which is you're factorizing a matrix. into a product of lower and upper triangular matrices. So Gaussian elimination actually does this. Or another way of saying is that Gaussian elimina elimination is providing such a factorization this factorization 